Glad to see you all here, especially my students who are in the class last semester. It's nice to see you, Sarah. Uh, this is a conversation with Mark Levy, combat medic in Vietnam and award-winning author. We're going to talk from about 12:30 to 1:30. At 1:30, we'll take a pause. So anyone who has a two o'clock class, if you need to do that then, feel free. Otherwise, please stick around for more Q and A. This event is sponsored by the History Department's American Discovery Series. So I just want to quickly thank the chair of the department, Dr. Schneid, and my colleagues for supporting this event, which made it possible for us to bring this movie to you from Salem, Massachusetts. And of course, I want to thank him for making the trip here. There's going to be another event this evening. If you know anybody who's interested in this and couldn't come this afternoon, at 5.30, it's going to happen at the High Point Museum, which is just, what, five minutes from here. So spread the word if you have friends or peers who would be interested in this. <coughs> I'm going to offer a very brief introduction, two minutes tops, and then I'll turn it over to Mark. In the fall of 1969, Mark Levy enlisted in the Army. The U.S. had been sending combat troops to Vietnam for the past four years, and it would be another four years before those combat troops would soon find Vietnam after the signing of the peace treaty. By the end of this longest war, it was the U.S.'s longest war at the time, more than 50,000 American men and women had lost their lives, and some three million or more Vietnamese men, women, and children had been killed. The Vietnam War invites many questions, and I, as I tell my students, I can't possibly present all the answers to you in one semester, not in one year, probably not in the entirety of your time here at campus. But what I do invite you all to do today is take this hour to hear from somebody who served there and is going to present you with images, photographs, stories, anecdotes. Mark was a combat medic with Delta 1st of the 7th, 1st Cav. His unit was in north, an area northwest of Saigon near the border with Cambodia. He served from 1969 to 1970, and in May of 1970, his unit was one of the units that participated in the invasion of Cambodia. In November of 1970, he ended his one-year tour of duty, returned to the United States, was discharged from the military in 1971, and then in the years that followed, uh, graduated with a degree in social work, and was a social worker for many years working with veterans. Traveled extensively, Israel, Central America, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, Europe. It wasn't until the late 1990s that some veteran friends of his told him about a place at UMass Boston called the Joiner Center. This was an academic program that was directed towards veterans to encourage them to write about their experiences, to bring them together for workshops, to share their stories, and turn them into powerful narratives for the broader reading audience of the public and also for people like myself who want to use them in the classroom. Since that time, Mark has published, well, here I can bring you up a, a, a very abbreviated version of a CD, four books, many poems, essays, articles, short stories. His essay, The Quiet Time, won the 2016 Syracuse University Institute for Veterans and Military Families Writing Prize. And his website, Medic in the Green Time, I encourage you to check it out. It's been running since 2000. 
2007, and it includes not only Mark's work, but also the voices of other veterans, uh, historical and archival documents, many, many links. We could spend hours on it and only scratch the surface. So thank you all so much for being here. And at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Mark Levy, and I'll be navigating his <coughs> images here on the screen. OK. So uh, thank you all for coming. And <clears throat> what I want to do is uh, show a, a short film that I wrote about 20 years ago. And the, it, it's about four or five minutes long. And it's based on an experience I had giving a class at NYU to Marilyn Young, whose book you may have read or whose name you may have heard. She was one of the first uh, American writers to give a broader pers perception, perspective on, on the American involvement in Vietnam. She included just a whole lot more history and facts, um, the kind of informed, uh, at that point, the received wisdom or the official story. And then after that uh, clip, then I'd like to uh, show a bunch of slides, most of them that I took on uh, this little Yoshika camera that I carried. There were no cell phones, there was no internet and tell some stories about each um, slide. So let's go right into that. What I did before reading Vietnam 101, my brief interview of what it meant to be a grunt, before showing the slides, before reading the extracts from the after action reports, before reading the poems that filled in the blanks, what I did was ask the students, 17, 18, 19 years old, I asked them to put down all the things they carry in 1990s culture, beepers and pagers, email, credit cards, cell phones and headphones, your basic New York black. What's left, I asked, the blank stares rooted in unblemished faces. Your youth, I said. You understand that? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Now I'd like you to think about something violent in your life, a car crash, a street fight, Maybe someone you know killed. Without warning, my emotions kicked in. Tears welled up. My voice went high. I stuttered, pinched my thumb and index finger hard like this to calm down. After my jaw stopped quivering, I finished the introduction. I want you to think of losing someone close. Your father, your mother, your best friend. They looked at me strange, but I was choking up, remembering Skinny Bob, Bill Williams, Dawson, Gan, and Wilson, Dorio, Larry Roy, half the platoon, three quarters of the company, wounded. I looked away, reached deep down, and reminded the kids of what they'd just imagined. No toys, just violence and loss. The last thing I want to say and they never saw it coming. The last thing I want to say is, welcome to hell. No one spoke. Can we have the lights off, please, I said, and flicked on the projector. The slides fell quietly into place. That's Ken, I said. He was killed. That's triple canopy jungle. You see how it layers and blocks out the sun? That's me and Jerry. We shared bunkers together. Then the good grunt shot, a guy leaning forward from the weight of his pack, steel helmet, two bandoliers of ammo crisscrossed like Pancho Villa, two frags on the pistol belt, 45 in the leather holster, U.S. cavalry and boast, canteens and lurk meals secured by D-rings. We used to get resupplied every three days by a helicopter, I said. You see those straps under my knees? We did that to keep the leeches from crawling up to our private parts. 
My M16 hung sideways like a stiff metal flag, locked and loaded, safety off. And beneath my rifle, that's my aid bag where I kept my bandages and morphine serrettes. The bag held two claymores before I found it. The pockets snapped shut. The bandages, wrapped in thick, transparent plastic, were always waterlogged. You see that face, that young face, how the features are shock set and weary? That's you, I said to the unblemished bodies in the darkened room. You get that way, dropping at every hint of an ambush, or worse. I wore my helmet backwards. It tended to crash down on my head and over my eyes, blocking my sight. Shake and bake, shot, screamed, medic. I patched him up, crawled back to cover, Corson, Timmy Day, and Beck piling on top of me. The second grenade hurtling from the wood line. Boom. Corson, last on, getting it worse. I showed them the really good slide of the platoon. Morrison with a 60, Gary Williams, drunk. Robbie from Oklahoma at 21, the oldest. The rest of us, 19. That's my yearbook, I said. Do you understand that? That's Vietnam, class of 70. Those are my best friends. It was quiet. The fan blades whirred inside the projector. Can we have the lights, please, I said. When people stop blinking, I read war poems. First, I'll read from the after action reports. They're pretty dry, mainly grid coordinates, type of action, casualty figures. You'd never know they're talking about human beings. On June 2nd, D Company had several automatic ambushes detonate, resulting in a total of 08 NBA KIA, 05 AK 47s and 01 SKS. I paused a moment. This is what really happened. You just need to know automatic refers to an American booby trap. Round eye means an American and a point. Point was the lead soldier in a patrol. Dead letter day. He sent the letter to the guy's wife the same day, leaving out the following. About two in the morning, the automatic went off, and nobody moved. We just waited for the morning light and the order to recon. There were two of them. One was dead. The other had been hanging on all night, waiting to blow away some round eyes before he bought it, too. He shot the second man, missing the point. The point opened up, and somebody threw a frag, and it was all over. Except that your husband took a bullet through his helmet that tore a gash in his head, and going down, shot the man in front of him. The blood was deep, dark red. He was lying flat on his back in shock. His eyes were wide open and lifeless, as if he could see everything. They say he lived a few days in the rear, even got up and spoke, then died. Head wounds are like that. She wrote back, first thanking him in the platoon for writing her, then going on and on for pages asking about his last moments. You could tell she was crying, and he cried too and did not reply to the desperate letter, and has desperately not replied ever since. Three poems later, I asked for questions. Looking back, would you have gone to war? Would you do it again? I'll tell you something I said to the unmolested ingenue. You want to get off? You want to get high? You want to top anyone's, hey, listen to this one. There's nothing that beats the rush from killing. I'll tell you something else, I said, face blushing with anger and sorrow. This one guy I know, and I trust him, he wouldn't make this up. He got so turned on once coming off a patrol, he jacked off on the side of a trail. The ingenue and several classmates squinted in disgust, but other questions followed. What do you think about draft dodgers? Did you have any problems readjusting once you got home? What do you think about the Vietnamese people today? They're human beings, I said, just like us. I checked my watch. Two hours had passed. Marilyn, sitting nearby, stood up, walked over, and gave me a hug. 
It was good, she said. It was really, really good. So that's, that film goes on, obviously. But uh, that gives you a kind of compressed view of what war is and, and what it does to you. So a couple of slides, a couple of stories. The first one called LZ Compton, that's, that's what a, a typical fire base in Vietnam looked like. Let's say it's 200 meters in diameter. It's ringed with bunkers. There's a no man's land about for 50, I don't know, 40 yards in circumference around it. Inside, some cannons, some bunkers for the cooks and for the communications people. We use this to pull guard in these little bunkers all around once or twice a month. Then we go back out into the jungle and go on patrol. So watch a patrol briefly. It would be a hundred people in a company going out into the jungle and they're freighted with their packs and their weapons and in the pack would be tinned food, sea rations, and they carried 12, uh, 12 quarts of water, ammunition, some personal stuff, roughly 60 pounds. Medic, I was the medic, some medical stuff, bandages and morphine and ointments and stuff. Steel helmets, not Kevlar. And basically what you did is you, where we worked, it was, there was no, there were no villages. So whatever moved, that was uh, a target. And the idea was that you're walking along and you do that for three, four, five hours a day in the jungle. Two seasons in Vietnam, hot season, dry season, monsoon for six months, and then desert heat for six months. So you're either sweating and grimy and covered with dust, or you're cold and grimy and covered in mud. This place would turn into a mud bowl in monsoon, and this is probably taken in dry season. You're covered with uh, red dust. I took this as we were coming in from a patrol. Um, you can see the machine gun, the door gunner had, and we're gonna probably land here and pull guard duty. Next slide. This is another great shot that a guy sent to me. Same, same LZ, but just a different angle this is all blown down, probably by what was called a combat vault. So in order to create an LZ, sometimes if there'd be all this jungle. The army would drop a, a gigantic bomb from about, let's say, 100. It would explode from 100 feet and blow down the jungle. And then we'd, they'd bring in uh, plows and bulldozers and then level the place and turn it and build it up. And there you are. There's a, a, a road. A your basic dirt road going around. And then all around is the jungle and whatever's out there. They didn't like us. Inside the uh, little closer perspective of the LZ, I lived here. <laughs> I've lived around. I lived here. This is not a New York apartment. This is a bunker. I lived there for about uh, two weeks. That's my friend Jerry up there. If you think it was muddy outside, it was muddy inside. And that's probably uh, my M16, and that's my pack because I recognize the ammo box. That was the one place that I could keep things that would be dry, be kept dry from, from the rain. Otherwise, uh, when it rained, it, it was pointless to, to try to stay dry. This is a man named Alfonso Gamble, and he was, I think he was from Detroit. So we're on this LD, we, LZ, we've just come back from Cambodia. And uh, we'd been there for 46 days, and it was dangerous. When I was in Vietnam, most of the combat I saw was in Cambodia. Every other day something happened, if not every day. I never saw big battles. It was small ambushes. We walk into them, they walk into us. It's kind of like, imagine being in the wrong part of town. It's dark out, and you're, and you're being stalked and you know someone's out there. Or imagine it's dark out, you're in the wrong side of town, and you're waiting to get hit by a car. 
Or imagine you're at a bar and, and you are witness to a bar fight. In all these examples, if you, if you can recall or imagine the kind of fear you have when you're being stalked or, or uh, you've seen a car accident or you've been close to a bar fight or you see somebody robbed or you've been mugged, that's the kind of fear you have when you're on patrol in the jungle. When you're in some place relatively safe, like a, an LZ, even though it's muddy, here he is, my pal, Sergeant Gamble, smiling for the camera. It's probably six, seven o'clock in the morning. He's brushing his teeth. Notice the black necklace around his neck with a little cross. In Vietnam, the black soldiers had a thing called the power movement. I think every black soldier that I knew and the black guys in my unit, we all liked them and they liked us. There wasn't that problem, but there were problems with racism in Vietnam, which you may have heard about. They wore, they wove those little necklaces out of their boot laces and they also wove uh, little wristlets and they gave a power sign. And every black soldier that I knew referred to himself as brother. So he would be Brother Alonso or Brother Bob or Brother Al. And they had a thing called the DAP. So if you met another black soldier, two black guys meet, they do this thing with a really complicated greeting. It was pretty cool. And it was a sign of solidarity. Um, the can that he's got in his right hand, that's, an old, that's a sea ration can. And he's using that to... Uh, rinse his mouth with, put a little water in there, brush his teeth. So he's uh, just about to start his, uh, his next lovely day in Vietnam. That's probably his pack over there. This is a guy named uh, Sergeant Biggin. And what, I, what I like about this picture is he might have been from Texas, but if you look at him, he's just got this incredible, intense, bold, authoritative stare. Uh, he was a good squad leader. And in this picture, uh, I think this base was just being built. So it, it, it looks kind of uh, just uh, not, not, not well organized. He's got his little canteen cup. This is probably taken again in the morning. And he is enjoying his morning cocoa. The main thing was he tried to get some kind of the small pleasures in life in Vietnam meant a lot. How did he make his cocoa? He took a little piece of plastic explosive. He put it on the ground. He lit it. He put some water into his canteen cup and then dumped in some, some cocoa that comes in the sea rations, lit the C4, which has a really high temperature. And it boiled the water in about 30 seconds. And he had uh, hot cocoa or coffee. This is my friend, Larry Hunter. Uh, he was a squad leader, good man. So we've moved from the uh, fire base out into the jungle. In the jungle that I was in, it was uh, in a place called Song Bay for the first couple of months of my tour. And it was beautiful. Uh, Dr. Fink just showed me that you have like this uh, botanical garden. And I was telling her that that's kind of like what Vietnam was like triple canopy, low foliage, then middle height foliage, and then you got the treetops. So the light that comes down is never bright, direct sunlight. And this is kind of like that. So th this is all, we were in like a, an area that was uh, bamboo and whatever the, the indigenous trees were. Behind him is a man we call Papasan. And he was part of a program called the Chu Hoi Program where NVA or VC soldiers that surrendered to us would uh, be retrained to work for the Americans. And uh, so he was about, I'm gonna guess 50 years old. And this picture exemplifies the kind of guy he was because he's kind of stealing the show in a stealthy way. And it turned out that he was a double agent. He worked for us, but he also worked for the NVA. He never really uh, gave allegiance to us. And one uh, evening on that fire base that I showed you in the beginning, we, 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 were, we had, there was a, a mortar attack. 
So if you know what a mortar round is, it, you drop a, a huge shell into a tube, it shoots up, there's a trajectory, it might uh, arc for two or three hundred yards and then it crashes down. The shell is about, let's say, this big. It kills and it maims. And when you hear the sound of the mortar tube popping in the distance, it, you have in, incredible dread and fear because you know the shell is going to fall and explode in probably five or six seconds. That's what happened that evening. We got hit by about, uh, let's say, 15 or 20 rounds plus a couple of rockets. And we found out later that he was the person that called in that attack. Well, this is my friend. I guess I took these, these pictures in the morning. This is a, a guy named Ed Torres from California. And he's also uh, doing what every good soldier does, uh, fighting Mr. Tooth Decay in the morning. And he also used an M60 machine gun can to keep his personal goods in so they wouldn't get uh, destroyed and decayed and mildewed by the, uh, by the rain. It's probably his pack hanging up. The sandbags over here, that's the beginning of a bunker. And it's, it's a monsoon. You can see if you look at his boots, they're all muddy. And those things under his knees, those are to keep the leeches out from, from calling up to your private parts. And he was about uh, 20 years old. Occasionally, he walked point, which is the first guy in the line of an infantry patrol, the most dangerous job. You're the first to get shot. And one day, we were taking a break on a patrol. And I was sitting, say, here, leaning up against a tree. And Ed was over there where Dr. Fink is, nothing personal. And he had his shotgun. Sometimes the point man had an M16, sometimes a shotgun. And we're talking. And somehow he knocked the shotgun over, and it went off. And, it, it, and the round from the shotgun hit the tree about five inches over my head. Uh, one of several uh, friendly fire incidents that I was involved in. Uh, this is my buddy, Jerry Beek. He was a squad leader. He's got that command presence. He was from Wisconsin. He's just a tough, tough guy. I think it is Polish, B-I-E-C-K, pronounced Beek. He's wearing what was called a, a monsoon sweater. That little necklace dangling outside the sweater was given to him by a, a chaplain. And about every, I'd say once a month, the chaplain, the army chaplain, will come out to the company in the jungle and be accompanied by the finance officer. So there we are, grunts, in the middle of the jungle. There's not a Walgreens or a Kmart for at least 100 miles, probably 10,000 miles. And the chaplain does his thing and holds a service. Everybody puts down their weapons. The wafers are given out. Blessings are dispensed. Hymns are sung. And I'm scared, insert profanity here. I, I was terrified. And, and they're singing, you know, Kiri Lezan or whatever was appropriate to a jungle service. I just didn't get it. And he would dispense, the, the priest would dispense these little things and, and nylon crosses. And then the paymaster, who came with a valise full of carbon copies with uh, military script, not dollars, but this special money that the army printed up, stapled to each person's receipt. So everybody was getting $100 and $150 a month, maybe a little more. So we get paid in the jungle. Where are you going to go with $150 in your pocket in the jungle? To this day, I don't know. This is my captain. His name is Leland Heislop. He was originally a National Guard. He wanted to be active in the Army, so he activated himself. He loved combat. And I was telling Dr. Fink uh, earlier today, we were in an ambush. Uh, three NVA came walking by. We happened to be there, really not looking to get involved. We were waiting to get picked up by helicopters after two or three weeks in the jungle. And people opened up on these three young guys, probably you know, eight, like us, 18, 19 years old. Never forget, as I'm telling these stories, that the Vietnamese are here. 
That's something that I find a lot of Vietnam vets leave out. It's, it's all about the Americans. But it's the Vietnamese also, in, in my opinion. So the captain, uh, everyone in this little ambush, is, they were scared, they were disorganized, and what does the captain do? And I thought he was old. I was 19, he was 32. I thought, he's an old man. Now, from where I'm at, you know, he's in great shape, he's a young guy, kind of bears a resemblance to Ernest Hemingway. Smile for the camera, and please, Captain, keep your hand off the trigger, which he kindly did. What did he do in that ambush where everyone was screaming and shouting and, and just shooting at will he, he, and hiding, laying down? He just stood up and, and just picked these three guys off like they were fish in a bow. Uh, so we all, uh, in that context, found him uh, exceedingly trustworthy and respectful. Captain Heislop. What he's got in his helmet up there, that's called bug juice. It was a probably toxic uh, bug spray to keep off. I don't think it ever worked for uh, the mosquitoes, but we would use it if you got a leech on your body. And what the leeches would do was, you know, they latch onto you under your uniform and then they would slowly engorge. And I remember one day we were for some reason, sleeping in a swamp. I have no idea why. We tended to try to shoot for the dry ground. So this guy wakes up with a leech that's on him from here to here. And it's probably that thick. And he's freaked out. I mean, who wouldn't be freaked out? So I took my little bottle of bug spray and sprayed it on the leech. And it just shriveled up and, and, and it fell off. Every guy has that kind of little story. But what a handsome man and, and uh, what a leader. Um, this is uh, a, an LZ, a, a Firebase slide. And uh, it was published in a little magazine called Radipalax. I took it and I thought it was uh, funny. And to GIs and to grunts who, who, who constructed it, it was hilarious. I thought it was brilliant as well in that context. So what we have is, this is a, a fellow named Randon Peterson. He was in another company. This was his bunker when his unit would come in on patrols and, and he would stay in here. And what he did was, uh, I guess he found this enemy skull somewhere in the jungle, kept it probably in his pack, and then impaled it on a bamboo stake, took an old boonie hat, because we all had boonie hats, and put it on on, on the guy's uh, head, half of head. And those two little black marks that you see, those are meant to be the rank of a captain. So those are called captain's bars. And it, it doesn't show too well in the clarity of the photograph, but he'd also constructed glasses made out of wires. So this is real GI uh, gallows humor, or what's also called black humor, because it's so dark. and. It, I think a friend of mine's writing a book on war and language and the semiotics of language in relation to war. So I, I have to show this picture to her because there's a lot going on. You've got a Vietnamese skull with an American officer's rank and an American's boonie hat. What, I won't even get into it, but as an image, the first thing that comes to my mind right now is if you've uh, ever read William Golding's The Lord of the Flies, what animates that book all the while between the savages and the civilized tribes are, is the dead pilot uh, and the head of a pig that's impaled on a stake, which the, uh, the savages had killed, and the flies that buzz around, which cause the seizures in uh, one of the characters, Simon. Um, LZ shot. So this guy. Here, his name was Ken. He was killed in an ambush. And uh, what happened was I was out of the platoon. I did eight months in the jungle. Medics were supposed to do six. Story for another day, I did eight. And then I got a rear job. He and a bunch, uh, you know, 10 or 12 other guys went on, on a patrol to recover an automatic ambush, an anti-personnel mine, a booby trap. 
here's a trail. You put two or three booby traps along that trail. You walk away 100 yards. There's a, there's a trip wire going across the trail. NVA or VC hit the trip wire. The mines explode, blow their legs off, mangle them. And we come in and we scavenge them for souvenirs, count the bodies, and leave. His patrol went out to scavenge an, an ambush composed of those mines. But they were seen by the enemy. And on the way back, they were ambushed in their turn. And he was hit, and three other guys were hit. And my replacement was a guy who I feel looked like his name. His name was Harvey Stringer. And I broke him in, and I said, I gave him my 45 and my aid bag, and I told him what, what this cream is for, and here's morphine surrettes, and here's how you do this and this when you have this kind of wound. And I just felt he did not belong in my unit. He did not belong in the Army. There was an actual program in Vietnam called Project 100,000. McNamara at the time wanted more men in the Army. So they started drafting guys who were basically unqualified. They either had physical deformities or they had criminal records or their IQ wasn't high enough, but the standards were waived so they could have more manpower basically in the infantry. And I believe that uh, Harvey Stringer might have been one of those guys. There was another guy who I actually I liked very much. Um, and he was also killed. They were, they may have bolstered the ranks of the infantry, but they were liabilities in terms of their actual fighting ability. So these guys, four guys were wounded. Harvey was my replacement. The medevac was called in. What the medevac does is it hovers, it drops a wench and the medic, and they kick out a litter, and the medic is supposed to um, attach the D-ring, the hook of the wench, to the head of the litter, and then they haul the guy back up. And four times, as I was told, uh, Harvey Stringer hooked the D-ring to the foot of the litter so the guys were hauled up feet first, which uh, is not a good thing, so they didn't make it. And it took me about 30 years, but I found him, and I spoke with him, and I just made a point of not letting on that I knew and left it at that. Oh, this slide I took before we were going out on patrol. And I, I just said to the guys, uh, hold it. And I think it's been downloaded a whole bunch of times. I've found it on Pinterest, is that what it's called? And Instagram and, hey, I'm, an, I'm a boomer, people. <laughs> So, it, and uh, Netflix actually contacted me about three years ago. They had found it on my website, and they wanted to use it in a, in a series called The Umbrella Factory. That's what it was called, the sci-fi series. And I said, uh, sure. And then I said, uh, because one of the characters was a Vietnam veteran, that was it. And I said, is there any compensation here? And they said, yes. And I said, great, I'll take it. <laughs> so they pay me a, a good chunk of change for the photograph. So who are these guys? On the end, a fellow from Maine who uh, was uh, shot in an, uh, in an ambush. One, one uh, NVA guy just popped up. We were in Cambodia because Mike had been sent too far out with a machine gun. And I was telling this to Dr. Fink, and th this uh, lieutenant, who was not a good lieutenant, he just wasn't, in my mind, in other people's minds, of an effective officer. And he sent Mike too far out on a flank, and uh, this uh, NVA soldier just popped up and shot him. And, and he, he was carrying the machine gun. The bullet went down the barrel of the machine gun lodged in his arm, but then another, bar another bullet hit him in the, in the uh, abdomen. And then a couple of guys finally ran up before the NVA guy had the chance to execute Mike, which is what Mike said was next. So we, we uh, dragged him back to safety, 
And as we're waiting for the helicopter, Mike, who is from Maine, reached into his pack and pulled out about a quarter pound of pot, which in those days we called dew. I don't know why, but that's what it was called. And I don't think I could do it now. I did it last night with Dr. Fink. But in his very Maine accent, he said something like, here, Doc, take this pot because I don't want to get caught in the rear with my pot because they'll court-martial me, Doc. And so he got sent back to the rear. And I gave the pot to somebody else because I didn't, I didn't use it. Someone else did. <laughs> <laughs> they really did. And uh, the other side of the story is that he, when I, I visited him twice in Maine over the last 20 years, he told me that they had to take out uh, like five feet of his intestine because of the way he was shot at close range. And then uh, he, he had a long career as a, he was a postman and then he was also a pipe fitter. And uh, he, he's had a tough, a tough life in some ways, um, but uh, he was a great soldier. The next guy, this guy here, we called him Shake and Bake because he, he went to sergeant school, but it was only for six weeks. And he was a pretty good soldier, but that was his nickname. This guy with the cross in his helmet, his name is uh, Ray Williams, and I was telling Dr. Fink last night that uh, he got wounded. We used to uh, shoot these flares off at night sometimes on an LZ. Think of an, uh, an aluminum tube about this big. You take the top off, you put it on the bottom, you smack it, and, a, and a, a flare goes up in the air. And a parachute made out of silk deploys, and this little magne magnesium flare swings back and forth. It's good for about a minute, a very bright light. And somebody had used one, but it must have been a dud. They threw it on the ground, and the next morning we're policing up all this expended ammo, the shells and whatever else. And he, accident, he kicked one by mistake that, that uh, was still active. It was not a dud, and it went off, and I was right there. I was an eyewitness. It made this whooshing sound, Whew, hit him right in the nose, and then ricocheted off into the sky, and the parachute deployed, and the flare came down and swung back and forth. And there he is with his nose split open. And so I wrapped a bandage around him. We called in a medevac. And off he went. And I thought, well, that's it. Lucky him. It's called a million-dollar wound because it's not that bad. But it's going to get him out of combat. And he'll probably go home. And two weeks later, he had a nice little scar. And he was back with us. I don't know how they did it. Probably butterfly his nose as a, a butterfly bandage. OK. This guy here with the. Uh, with a beer can, that's Gary Williams from Tennessee, a shammer. A shammer was someone who always complained to try to get out of the jungle. And that's what he did. But uh, everyone kind of liked him because he, he, he was personable. And that's a can of, of, of uh, I don't know if they, do they still make Paps Blue Ribbon beer? Yeah. yeah. Well, he, someone said, yep. <laughs> <laughs> How do you know? <laughs> this guy right there with the ammo going across. That's a bandolier of 16 magazines. That's John Roop. I thought he was old. In that picture, he's 21 years old. His, we called him Roop the Troop. And he had, I can't do it, but he had a real Oklahoma accent. Real, he elongated all his words. Doc, I think I got a, a cold today, Doc, and he like that. This guy here was my buddy, Jim Lamb, a machine gunner. We we're best friends. So what he's carrying is the uh, M60 machine gun. It weighed about 26 pounds. He's got a belt of machine gun ammo, a couple of smoke grenades. Why smoke grenades? Because if uh, we wanted a chopper to come in, you take a, the, we'd call in for a chopper, and then he or the radio man, the RTO, would take a smoke grenade, pull the pin, the, the grenade would ignite within a second, and he'd throw it, and you get these clouds of colored smoke. So this is an example of smoke going off. And we're calling in a medevac because what happened was uh, there was an ambush. We ambushed a whole bunch of people. And uh, it was five claymores going across a big trail like this. And they hit it around 2 o'clock in the morning. So imagine one claymore has the equivalent of about 12 sticks of dynamite. And it contains 700 BBs, large BBs. So when it blows up, it's kind of like a gigantic shotgun shell. And it's down on the ground. And it spews out. Uh, all these BBs um, 
in a 180 degree arc, whew, like that. And it basically blows people's legs off first, and then who's ever in, in, uh, outside of that range, they, they get uh, perforated with uh, all these BBs that go into them, and it tends to uh, uh, do you know, lots of destructive damage and mangle, mangle them. So five of these things went off all at once. So you multiply five times 12, that's whatever it is, 60, 70 sticks of dynamite and 3,000 BBs going out all at once. There was this incredible bright white light. And then people, there were about 100 people that got caught. The first 40 or 50 were the ones that were in the immediate area of, of all these claymore mines. And they howled and howled and howled like animals. I'd never heard anything like it. It was so bad I had to cover my ears. We went to, we were about 150 yards, 60 yards away. Uh, we, we, what's what called recon, we reconned the area the next morning and we found all these uh, people uh, dead, seven or eight of them. They just laid down and they died over the night. It was, uh, it was a terrible night, but this is what war is. And one of them was this guy who, uh, the lieutenant, we surrounded this, all these people that were dead. And then there's one guy over here. And the lieutenant walks up to him, uh, my lieutenant, and told him, Chu Hoi, because he moved. He was an older guy, but he was uh, alive. And everybody's beating on this guy. There's 20, 25 grunts, kind of in a horseshoe. And this guy over there, and somebody else next to him, and the lieutenant yells, Chu Hoi, surrender. And this guy was hardcore. He believed in what he was doing, which is what the Vietnamese were doing. They were protecting their country from the Americans who were basically invading it. And he raised up his AK, and the lieutenant blew him away from, you know, two yards. And then everybody opened up, including Jim Lamb on the machine gun. So when the smoke from the machine gun and the M16 cleared, this white cloud of cordite smoke. Uh, that guy had no head. He'd been decapitated by the bullets. But the girl next to him, who was here, she, was, she started to move. So she'd been claymored that night. And then she got hit with machine gun fire and M16s in the morning. And the lieutenant said to me, Doc, get up there and help her. So that's me walking up to her. So imagine her. She's been there all night. She's uh, lost a lot of blood. She's dehydrated. And she is reaching for my canteen. Now, I'm 19. I am politically and morally naive. I, did, I, I just did not have a moral compass, a developed moral compass, or a developed political compass. I, and as well as the propaganda that, that we learned in basic training, basically that the enemy was not human and, and what they are worthy of is being killed, annihilated. What's the spirit of the bayonet? That's, that's what comes across in any uh, GI movie you've ever seen. As well as that, it was having been in combat a bunch of times, it all boils down to they want to kill us, so we have to kill them first. They are not human beings. They, they literally, in my mind, and I believe in everybody else's mind in my platoon, they were bugs. They were aliens from another planet. They were objects. They did not have feelings. They did not have you know, husbands, wives, sons. So what am I going to do? She's reaching for my canteen. And I'm thinking, everyone's watching me. And they're thinking, what's Doc going to do? And I'm also thinking, this is a canteen of water. I've got 12 canteens. I'm probably down to two. If I give her that canteen, that's one whole day's worth of water that I'm going to be without. That's where my values were. That's where my mind was. So I, it, rather, it was no moral decision. It was no practical decision. I don't know what it was. But at the last moment, I handed her the, the canteen. And she grabbed it. 
and glugged it down. And in my mind, in my 19-year-old mind, I thought, well, that's it. That canteen is now unusable. It's contaminated. It's poison. And I, I'll have to get another canteen. Her legs were broken from the bullets. So there was nothing I had to um, brace them with. So I found some rotten bamboo and strapped that around her legs. And then we called in a medevac. And the medevac came in, and they hoisted her up. And we learned later that there were, from her, hopefully they didn't interrogate her uh, too badly. I don't know what, if she lived or died. But uh, she s informed whoever she spoke to that there were about 100, 115 people in the line that she was in that got hit by that ambush. We heard them running away. The first 20, 30, 40 people got terribly wounded. And then we heard the people in the back running, stampeding off, yelling, and then they were gone. And the ones that, were, that, that they abandoned, they died uh, slow deaths over the night. So the NVA, you know, just to find, yeah. so the NVA were the North Vietnamese Army, which gets a little more, more complicated, but we refer to them as the North Vietnamese Army. And they, were, they had green uniforms, and they wore, unlike us, we wore these heavy steel pots that weighed like five pounds, and they really weren't very good, which is why I wore mine backwards, because it clouded, it, it obscured your field of vision. They wore pith helmets, which might, might have weighed like four, five or six ounces. And they had uh, AK-47s, and, and, and most of their equipment came from China. So they were a, a, an army. The VC of Viet Cong were the, uh, more localized to South Vietnam. And they tended to wear uh, not civilian clothing, but kind of black, black top, black pants. And, the, and, and they didn't wear boots. They wore these things, basically sandals that they made out of American uh, tires. And we called them Ho Chi Minh slicks. And, some, and I've seen them marketed. You know, you can buy them commercially now. So who were in this particular? In, in, OK. Are they VC? Oh, I see. It's just because if you say people, it could also sound oh, okay. like they, or if they're civilians yeah. who are just walking through. Oh, no, no. The, so she was just one of the survivors from this ambush, and they were, it was a, probably a company of NVA because we found their packs. And, uh, you know, after the ambush, we scavenged through all the stuff that, that was on the ground, packs and weapons and ammunition. And I was telling Dr. Fink about uh, 20 years ago, I visited uh, one of the radio men in my platoon, and he had the pack that belonged to the NVA medic that we had killed. And, and uh, he was a really tough soldier. He was into booby-trapping bodies, just a story for another day. But when he brought that pack out, you know, this happened when both of us were 19. But when he brought the pack out in his basement, and there was still blood on it and some bullet holes, he cried because he had, um, evolved to a point of uh, moral clarity and moral awareness where he could um, see that he had uh, taken you know, a human life, not just some, some object. Okay, I've got about five minutes left. Before so, we move on to the Yeah, oh, okay, so another slide, okay. So this is a what's called a chuhoi leaflet. So there were many different kinds, but basically their purpose fell within what was called a PSYOPs operation. PSYOPs means psychological operation. And what the United States did was, over the course of the war, drop millions of these things, some like this, some with pictures and print, printing rather than hand-drawn uh, handwriting, hoping to convince the NVA or the VC to surrender. So they dropped them in the jungle. And so I, I have about 10 of them, and I had them translated by a friend who was in the Joiner Center, a, a fellow who had 
um, escaped Vietnam, a civilian who left Vietnam. And I asked him to translate this. There are different themes that are employed to try to convince people to give up. So some of the themes were nice, and some of them were like, there'd be a picture, a grisly picture, and it would say, give up or you're going to look like this. Or there'd be two guys that had given up, and they were smiling because they had clean clothes, and they had money, and they were, they were happy. So it was propaganda. This one falls into the category of, it, it, it's, it's deceptively nice. The rough translation is basically brother, because in, Vien in the Vietnamese culture, it's brother, father, sister, mother, brother. Wouldn't it be good for you to be home this spring? It's spring. Don't you want to be back with your family smelling the blossoms? Don't you want to celebrate the new season? And it goes on. And think about it. There's still time. Come over to the Americans. We're here waiting for you. And the idea was you take this pass, so to speak, and you hand it to any friendly American that you happen to meet in the jungle, and they will happily accept you as a surrendered uh, prisoner who's now going to work for us. And, 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 and some VC and, and obviously some NVA actually did that. What I like about this slide is it's, so, it's a work of art. It is, it's just stunning. You have this beautiful woodcut, simple colors, and uh, the Vietnamese language that, that just feels so alive. Yeah, so I took this after the, uh, let's see, 1990s, I, tr I first started traveling. So I lived for eight months in Guatemala in the mountains. And I would use that where I was living as a place to uh, come back to because I would also travel around Guatemala and also in Honduras and El Salvador. I was backpacking. And in the village, it was called Todos Santos de las Cuchumatanas. Todos Santos in the Cuchumatanas mountain range. So it was at about 10, 000, 9 or 10,000 feet. And uh, it was wonderful. No phones. No banks, no TVs, no internet, obviously. Um, and I would walk in the mountains every day, not knowing that I was kind of reliving the war by doing all this walking. And it got to know people because they got to see me day after day. So these are boys in the village wearing their traditional uh, clothing. It's all handmade on a loom by the women. And what are they doing? They're, they're bringing down wood from the mountain that their dads have probably chopped with these big, heavy timber axes. And they're not afraid of me, except maybe this guy is, because I was a gringo. And my Spanish today is as bad as it was then, but I, I tried. So after uh, Guatemala, I traveled uh, in uh, Honduras and uh, El Salvador, many adventures, but I also traveled in uh, Singapore, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia, Thailand, and uh, again, many, many adventures, a lot of and some flashbacks. And uh, by the time I got back to the States, that's when I, somebody told me that I thought they thought I should see somebody about PTSD. And maybe we'll talk about that.
a show of hands if you've got a question in mind. So I've got Will, Zach, Olivia, Garrett, Dylan, Bunny. That's a good start. All right, so Will, your hand shot up, so I'm going to pick on you first. Go ahead. What were your thoughts on Vietnam before you went there? It's a great, so the question is, what were my thoughts before I went to Vietnam? And I, my, my folks were basically uh, blue collar and not, that, not at all politically informed. So I bought the Time Magazine propaganda, which basically what it was, reporting the American line, the White House line. So between Time Magazine and the army propaganda that I read when I went down to the recruiting station. I didn't know anything about Vietnam. I didn't know anything about why we were there. I didn't know anything about the people or the culture or the politics. So in some ways, not necessarily in the same proportion, what I didn't know about Vietnam, the leaders who were in charge also didn't know, but to answer your question directly, I had no idea. It was, uh, I, was a, I was the perfect candidate to go to Vietnam. If, you know, a little bit of biographic stuff. I needed to get out of a bad home situation. I needed to, some leadership in my life and the home life was not conducive to that. So where did a lot of young guys find themselves in those days, join the army, get a career, and, and so on. I don't know, there aren't too many job openings for machine gunners these days, but um, there's a, a, a guy named uh, Doug Peacock who was a special forces medic. So special forces, Delta Force, Navy SEALs, Rangers, recon, they get special training, they get special skills. Special forces a year, Delta Force probably longer, SEALs at least a year, really tough. You really get selected to, to be an elite soldier. So they learned a little bit more than I did in terms of uh, the language, the culture, uh, how to fight in a war. But they were focused, they were laser focused on uh, just doing their job. And I've met some people that, uh, you know, if the issue is one of uh, evolution, go over as a killer, come back disillusioned, and uh, over time evolve a moral con conscience. That was kind of my story. I, was, I didn't go over as, as a gung-ho guy. I just went over there because that was what I was told to do. I volunteered, but it wasn't out of any uh, patriotic, you know, it wasn't for patriotism. It just wasn't. Does that help? Okay. Um, you mentioned earlier that you enjoy traveling, and it seems like you've been practically all over the globe, Europe, Argentina, South America, etc. Would you ever consider going back to Vietnam or anywhere in that region just to see how it's been transformed or the culture now or anything of that sort? I would I go back to Vietnam to see how it's changed. So I went back in uh, 1994 and it, 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 there'd been people back before that, Americans and, and, and uh, internationalists. So when I got there, it, it hadn't reached the point where it was becoming totally capitalist, which it is kind of now. I think they were still coming out of what was called the Doi Moi period. There was a relaxing of the, the regime and the ability to engage more on a market kind of economy. So the people that I, it was still, the war was still within relatively immediate memory. You know? Whereas now from the friends that I've talked to who go back fairly often, it's completely changed. The younger generation, the war is kind of like for you guys. It's, it's like 
It's, it's in another world. It's not in their uh, frame of mind. It's just not there for them. It's the older generation um, and the people that I met when I was there, basically pretty friendly. Like, um, but there have been examples, at least one I know of, where uh, older people who have survived bad stuff, that they're not happy with the Americans, and, and I don't blame them. Yeah. Um, I find it kind of sad to see. I, I went to this place in 94 called Sapa in North Vietnam. And uh, it had been an old French colonial kind of resort for the army when the French were there. And the idea, as I understand it, was that the Vietnamese wouldn't bother the French army when they were there. It was just hands off, gentleman's agreement, if, if that was the case. And when I got there with a, a guy that I met and we were, started traveling together, um, it, is, it had become a backpacker's haven. So there was all these little guest houses. You could get a good room for like five bucks. And there were all these little, pretty good little restaurants. And it was just a kind of a little cozy town. It still had character. It still had the old French architecture. It wasn't dominated with neon and glittering signs and, and uh, souvenir touristy stuff. And even still, in, there was a, a market off the side that was the, the indigenous market. The indigenous tribe that was, that's still in Zappa are the Hmong. And I don't think I have any photographs of them, but they wore blue, head to toe blue in their, in their sort of their, their uh, customary dress. And uh, the women wore a lot of jewelry, like a silver spangly jewelry. And they were, uh, I, I guess you'd say, they were a handsome people, and they were proud people. And they supported themselves through their agriculture. And so Sapa, around the, the town, it's all terraced and very beautiful. These beautiful terraces that it's carved into the hills and and there would be water buffaloes and people behind these, you know, thousand-year-old process of plowing the rice paddies with the, the water buffalo and the old wood plow, harvesting the, the wheat with handheld scythes. So my friend and I went on this walk, which I'm told by another friend, if you go on this walk outside of town, you have to wait in line. There are lines of people. When I was there, in 94, there was nobody. So we went, we walked for, let's say, three or four miles. We, we had a great, arduous, wonderful walk. We met some uh, guy in a wooden shack drinking whiskey. It was raining, it was pouring. He's sitting and he's, he's drunk uh, and he's playing his little Jew's harp. Twang, 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 twang. And it was just wonderful. And then by the time we got back, we were soaking wet. But uh, we're walking and getting close to town. And there's a woman on a, on a rice dike terrace. And she sees us. She's a Hmong woman. She's probably 25, 30 years old. And she's all, she's got her wonderful blue clothing on and she's got some earrings on. And she raises, she stands up and she's got the scythe in her hand. And what does she say? Two dollars. She wanted to sell us her scythe for two bucks. That was the direction that Sapa was going in. Because I saw in the center of town a bunch of tourists gathered around these two Sapa women, also in their traditional clothing, and, and, and these uh, the international tourists, Germans and Spaniards and whoever else, and they were haggling over how much she wanted for what she was wearing. And she was turning from one to the other. So she was becoming, you know, in, in a figurative sense, corrupted by capitalism. And now I'm told that, you know, old parts of uh, Saigon have just been taken down. Old parts of, whole parts of uh, Hanoi have been taken down. You've really got to hunt for the old Hanoi. And I walked around old Hanoi and it was, it was wonderful. 
I, I once was sitting in a cafe and I was looking out on this bustling street. It wasn't a boulevard like in Saigon. And it's just bustling with people. And in those days, it was bicycles. That's all you heard, the jingle of bicycle bells and the hum of the tread of the tires on the uh, pavement. And, that, and, and no one's talking. It was wonderful. Hundreds of people on bicycles. And in the midst of that, there's some guy, probably you know, 40-ish, 50-ish, sitting in a cart, like, like an iceberg in a stream. And, and, he's, and he's just beholding all this. There was something going on inside him. It was quite beautiful. I don't know if that, if, if those kind of moments still exist in Hanoi, because everyone's caught up in this frenzy of fast money. There was another question. No. Can you maybe talk about being a Swaz first experience in the field or organic? What was going through your head? Oh, yeah. Did you feel adequately prepared? Uh, no. I mean, no, I wasn't uh, prepared. Yes, I'll answer the question. Uh, I remember on my first patrol going out, like in the first 20 minutes, I thought, I don't like this. I want to go home. Because I was still, as they say, pissing stateside water. I still had this feeling like, you know, if I want to, I can really just say I want to leave. But there was no choice. So I had to acclimate to just the, the physical rigor of patrol. So maybe two or three weeks later, a month later, uh, one platoon set up some claymores. And my platoon would say, over there, 100 yards, 50, whatever. And three or four NVA walked into it. And the claymores were blown. And then the GIs, who were ranged out, you know, five or six meters apart, just started opening up on these people, just picking them off. And then that platoon called for my platoon to come over for support, which they didn't really need, but I guess they did it. So we ran through the jungle, and the GIs that are doing the shooting are here, and I was over here, and the NVA guys that were down were probably in the back row there. And I watched it happen, and I knelt down on one knee and, and leaned, used my M16 to kind of lean against, and I watched it, and I remember thinking, how can they do this? Because these guys that, were, that had been wounded, so they, they had their legs blown off, and they, had, they were trying to hide behind some logs, and they were jamming their AK-47s beneath the logs and trying to shoot out from under these logs. And they were screaming to each other. And um, all I could think of was, how could, how could anybody do this? How could one human being do this to another. And that was my first experience. And then we scavenged the bodies and so forth. And then about, say, three months later, after I'd seen a little more action like that, small stuff, never, never big battles, small you know, encounters, I became hardened to the extent that, uh, you know, I was always afraid and my guys always protected me. But I got to a point where we, you know, after an ambush and there were some more dead people, were walking past them, walking past the bodies and this one NVA guy springs up. He just got up right as I walked past and and they allowed him to surrender. And I was so angry because my immediate response, not a thinking response, but my um, immediate emotional response was, why did you take him prisoner? Why didn't you shoot him? So I had made this transition from new guy to not new guy anymore. And it, uh, it took a while to get past that. 
Uh, another question. Yeah. So the question is, how did I confront that moral, the moral, OK. How did I confront that moral evolution? Um, I, I remember uh, starting to write about Vietnam maybe 10 years after the war, and then around 15 years after the war, I got involved with v Vietnam veterans against the war and started just hearing guys being a little bit more sympathetic to the enemy. And then I joined the William Joyner Center around 1999. And it's a long story. I'll, I'll make it brief. Are you familiar with Bao Ninh and the Sorrow of War? So he was a North Vietnamese soldier, and he was in combat for seven years. And he's one of Vietnam's the greatest writers. And his, he wrote one of the, probably the greatest book on the war novel from the Vietnamese perspective. And uh, I read his book when I was in New Zealand after work, and it would just transport me, but I didn't know why. And then I traveled in Asia, and then when I came back, uh, I was living in New York, and I met some people that could get me in touch with him. So I was afraid to try to find him in Hanoi. So then I bought a copy of the book when I was in New York, and that's when I first saw his face on the back of the book jacket. And it, it kind of freaked me out because he looked like every Vietnamese we'd ever killed. But I was able to send him a letter, and I wrote to him. And a while later, I got this Christmas card in the mail from him. And it really moved me. So maybe about uh, a couple of months later, I met these guys who were involved with the Joiner Center, because I hadn't been involved at that point. And they s suggested that I go. The two-week writers conference at UMass Boston. And the focus is always on war and its social consequences. So the first day there was an orientation of, with the faculty and the students, about 150 students, and you know, a, a dozen and a half faculty. And every faculty member gives a little talk. And then and I'm sitting in this, this room crowded with people, rows and rows of chairs. And these five guys that are standing on the side waiting to make their entrance to the podium, I look at them and I notice one of them, and it's bound in. I didn't know he was going to be there. He didn't know I was going to be there. Each one of them gives a little talk. And then as bound in was leaving, just as he got to the door, I called out his name. And very few people in the audience knew him at that point. And he turned, he kind of whipped around. And he, and he said, uh, he just looked, and I called out, like from here to the door. I said, it's Mark Levy. And he, he looked, and his eyes opened wide, and he said, Mark Levy, Mark Levy. And he, and he rushed to me. We rushed to each other. And you know, he was about 5'6", and sinewy, and really good shape. And he's wearing you know, these polyester clothes and polyester pants. And he lifted me up. And he put me down. He did that, I think, two or three times. And then he slapped me on the back. And then I started weeping, and I could not stop. And a woman who was there, her name was Lady Borton. She was part of this delegation. She was an American who had worked as a nurse for both sides during the war. She spoke fluent Vietnamese. So she translated between me and Bao Nin for about five or six minutes. And then he had to go. So we decided to meet the next day. And I interviewed him for about three hours. And that became an interview that was pretty good. It's on my website. It's OK. And then about 25 years later, a guy from India, a journalist, contacted me. 
and we set up an interview with Bao Nin, and it's a really great interview. So if you're interested in the stuff, it's on the website. What, what happened was all of this emotion that I'd been holding in, it came up when I saw him. And I think the emotions were obviously, you know, grief and sorrow and uh, loss, which he had seen and, and experienced 10 times more than, than I did. In his unit of 500 people, uh, 10 survived, survived, not, not you know, wounded and, and, and 490 KIA, 10 survivors. Uh, question? Yes. How did it affect my religious beliefs? Or your war? I just know that I was able to observe the Vietnamese and, and respect their culture, their, their, their awareness of their place in the world, not simply as Vietnamese, but as human beings. They're so much more tolerant and so much more authentic. That's, that's all I can think of. I, mean, I made a point of the countries that I went to, I made a point of going into the churches in Guatemala, in Mexico. There's some great peasant churches in Mexico where the peasants are on their knees lighting candles on the floor swinging these sensors of incense. And, and, you know, it's, it, it's like a chimney going off in this enclosed space, but you know, they felt it. Um, I wrote a story called Seven of Diamonds, Six of Hearts. It's on the website. I had been traveling with this guy, who, a good photographer. We ended up in a place called Natrang, which is a seaport town, grimy, I liked it. it. It was rough, but it was still Vietnam. It wasn't touristy. If we were the only, there might have been 10 tourists there. And there were these old wooden trawlers that had been brought up onto the, the shore for you know, getting patched up. And my friend wanted to take a picture. So we got close, and then he wanted to climb on board to take a picture f f with that vantage point. So was, and we got the, the, the sailor's permission. Was, this old, tough, weather-beaten, whiskered Vietnamese sailor guys. And what does my friend do? He sits down in what looks like a barrel, cut in half, full of sand. And he starts to prepare his camera. And the sailor comes over, and he growls at him, and he pantomimes, basically uh, insert profanity get out, get out. So what my friend, and, and my friend's like, what did I do? What is the problem? Well, he had sat down in the receptacle for the joss sticks, which the Vietnamese would put into the sand and light to pray to their ancestors. Very bad. So they let us off the hook, but that was a mortal sin. That was an example of, I guess, his ignorance and, and, to, and mine as well.